I want to welcome everyone here today. This is a terrific crowd. I believe we got a few more than, uh, <coughs> than we've been having, and we've been having good crowds uh, for our level talk service. It's a beautiful day. It's a good day to be here. We see that we've got to take some names off the prayer list, Amen. And, and that's always good. And uh, again, it's just good to see everyone here today, <coughs> uh, members and visitors. Uh, in the way of announcements, uh, and I'll go ahead and just read some, and if anybody's got a correction, just you need to interrupt me, I don't care. Uh, youth meeting today at 2.30, they're gonna be packing some uh, shoe boxes, uh, bring all donations. Family Life Center by 2.30 today, I would say that's still on go. So you still can bring some stuff by 2.30, is that correct? All right, so uh, ordination service for Doug uh, Griffin, so Doug was our interim, uh, and we're gonna have the service here. And uh, so uh, six o'clock, anything else on that? Uh, Brother Stephen here will have a part in that. And, Two preachers. Uh, yeah, well I said a part. Do you know what part he had? As of yesterday, as of yesterday, he wasn't sure what part he had, or, or at least how long he had, anyway. Uh, uh, Tuesday night, our men's prayer groups been meeting. You've, you've heard about that each week. We're probably two months into it, uh, something like that, and uh, it's really going well. We're having, uh, you know, about eight, nine men most nights, and uh, it, it's like I, I said in my Sunday school lesson. Even if you can't get here, around the seven twenty-five hour, something like that, is usually when we get to praying. So even if you're at home man and you can't get here you can certainly join us uh, at, at, that, at that time Wednesday night prayer meeting Bible study at 7 uh, so let's see uh, we want to have a, our usual uh, Thanksgiving meal uh, on Tuesday uh, as it says there the meat and green beans will be provided everybody else can bring vegetable dessert and uh, if you were uh, with our past appreciation, we had a little deal going on where we had people serving with the gloves and mask on, and so it's uh, pretty COVID friendly, as it says there. Anybody want to? Anybody need to speak on that anymore? Just remember, it's Tuesday, the twenty-fourth. Yes. Thanksgiving, and please, we need desserts, bread, and other vegetables. We we've we got the green beans, so we're gonna cook green beans. We'll have the green beans for you. Okay. And. Uh, Probably got a reminder, and it's also in here, last day to order, <coughs> two, 2021 calendars, magnetic notepads. That's a, uh, usually a, a type of fundraiser for WMU and the work they do. Uh, anything else announcement-wise coming Baptist, for us? Baptist Children's Home back here on the left. Yeah, I said you don't have to pay Oh yeah, I did miss that. Bad, okay. Uh, have we got... Envelope, envelopes. They're out back. Envelopes back here, back here. Okay, and that's all through the month. Correct. Okay, so uh, just remember that our goal was four hundred dollars. Anything else in the way of announcements? So we got a couple of birthdays. Uh, Jonathan Kimberly, seventeenth. Hillary Evans, nineteenth. Is Hillary working? She's she worked late there. last night, so she's probably okay. Waking up this morning. All right. I just have one more announcement. I, I, I did the bulletin. I forgot to put in there. Um, next Sunday, we will be um, voting on our church budget after the service, so um, just remember that. We got a copy of that last week if you were here. If you need a copy, there should still be some out in the, um, in the vestibule. So we'll be voting on the church budget next Sunday after worship service. Okay. I guess there's nothing else. We'll go to a worship service. <clears throat> Those of you didn't hear me because I wasn't at a mic, I didn't know if my mouth wasn't big enough to hear. But anyway, we did raise right at $2,000, and that's profit for our youth through the barbecue sale. So again, thanks so much for buying, for working, and helping make that successful. All right, let's get into our worship service today. Let's turn to 361, and let's stand and sing both verses as we uh, join in song and open our worship service. <coughs>
sing all three verses. Serve the Lord with gladness. <clears throat> Chapter 5, uh, Luke chapter 5, and 
This week, once again, we're going to go over the uh, seeing the absolute power of God. Uh, we started off in Luke chapter 4 and 1 through 13. We saw that uh, the Holy Spirit led Jesus up to be tempted and God was sovereign over temptation. Uh, we then see that he was, had uh, sovereignty over the demons in Luke 4, 33. Then he had power over sickness with Peter's uh, mother-in-law. And so now we just last week looked and seen that he had power over nature, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And then today we pick up in verse 12. Uh, that's Luke 5 in verse 12. I'll give you time to get there. And uh, today we're still going to look at his power. And uh, so I hope that it is a blessing today. And I hope that you allow God to speak to you through his word. And so as we start here in verse 12, we see, And it happened when he was in a certain city that, Behold, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and he touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses had commanded. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. Father, I can't thank you enough for touching me one day, Lord. I can't thank you enough for pulling me up out of the mud one day and dusting me off and setting me on the right path, God. And Lord, I pray today that under the sound of my voice that you open hearts and minds, God. I pray you peel religiosity away. Lord, help us to get over ourselves, as the song said, and worship you in spirit and truth today, Father. Lord, that your name be honored and glorified, Lord, because without you, there is no hope. And, and Lord, we just thank you so much for allowing us to come back together today, Father. I pray you have your will in your way and help us to preach your word in a way that is honoring to you. Father, I thank you, Lord. I pray for each heart and soul. And Father, we ask these things in your name. For your name is above all names. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want you to see us, uh, just a few things here, and then we'll get started into the preaching. Uh, there are three types of leprosy during that time. There was a, a dull white kind of leprosy, and then a clear white, and then there was a black uh, leprosy. And I know y'all love hearing the mountain guy say white. So I'll just say white a few more times. Like, I love how you say white. But anyway, <laughs> there was three different stages of it. Basically, if you could equate it to something, just like there's stages of, of cancer or stages of this, that, and the other, this was the last stage. The hope was gone. There was no more hope of being healed. This man had no hope. He didn't see anything helping him or anything being able to uh, get him out of this condition. Uh, as we see here in the scripture, it says it was full of leprosy. If you want to know where I get that idea that it was his last stages, it is because of the use of the word full. He had reached his fullness. At that time, the scholars would have said that even his veins would have been full of disease. Uh, the, the very disease was being pumped through his veins, not just on the skin, not just on a certain place, but it was even being pumped through the very uh, veins of him. It was at no hope point in the context of this story. See, I want you to understand a little bit about that they would have been an outcast because what was happening to him was incurable. So he was an outcast. Uh, he was unwanted. Nobody wanted the uh, guy around. It was a social stigma to have him around. And, and he was considered cursed uh, in that day and time. If you had leprosy, you were considered cursed. Like God had laid a curse on you. So of course the good Baptist in that day and time, they didn't want anything to do with any of them. So uh, some of y'all caught that, some of y'all didn't. Baptists <laughs> Baptist weren't there. But, but what, what had happened is he was at the point of no return. He was at the point where nobody wanted him around. Nobody needed him around. Uh, if he did get in a, in a distance of anyone, then he was viewed as, as someone who was trying to assault someone. He was, he was a, uh, a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, if you if you will. And so what I want you to see is he was aware of his condition. He knew that there was no hope for him. He was aware that, that no one wanted him around. He was aware that his sin was wearing on the outside. 
I, I want you to see something. See, a lot of people walk around with leprosy of the inside. <laughs> See, we're, we, we, we walk around with this, this disease that we're, we're, we're sinners and we need a Savior, but yet we're going to dress it up like we're something. And so what I want you to see is this leper had to wear his stuff on the outside. So not only did he know he was a sinner, but everybody else knew that he was a sinner and he needed somebody. And the second thing I want you to see is he became aware of a cure. Now, I want you to understand something about a leper. The lepers weren't a privy to the local newspaper. They weren't privy to the local uh, 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 gazette coming by. These people were not even allowed within the walls of the city. They were not wanted. So, so for him to get news of this cure that was coming his way meant that the name of Jesus was being proclaimed by all. That, that, that he had heard at a certain time about this man who could heal him. He was aware of a cure. In Matthew 8, chapter 2, he's telling the same story, but Matthew accounts it like this. He says that he was seeking, that he had sought. So this man knew that, that, that in this moment in time of his life that he needed to seek out Jesus. And whenever he saw Jesus... Now, I want you to understand something. A lot of Christians, they, they, they seek Jesus, they see Jesus, but they fail to do this last part here. Now, I want you to hear me if you don't hear anything else that I'm going to say today. There's a lot of Christians and, and Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and the whole thing of everybody that have gotten all the way up to the point. They know who Jesus is. They've seen what Jesus can do, but they've never surrendered to who Jesus is. Now, I want you to tell you something. Knowing him and seeing him is not like having a relationship with him. That's why in a lot of churches, even today, people are going to sit on the pews and slide right off into hell because the preacher hasn't got the, the gall to get up here and say that your religiosity, I don't care how good you dress it up, I don't care how nice you look on Sunday, without a personal relationship with Jesus, you're just going to burn in them clothes. Amen. But he became aware of the cure. And now I want you to see this. He surrendered to Jesus. He fell upon his face. Now I'm not going to ask you to go home and do this. But you can imagine in your mind. If, if you fall on your face. And you lay prostrate on the ground. You have no opportunity to defend yourself. You are defenseless. You have given up any, anything that you could possibly have to fight against. You have given it all over to whoever you have surrendered to. This man saw Jesus. He sought Jesus. And then he surrendered to Jesus. He fell upon his face and laid at Jesus' feet. Why? Because he knew that Jesus was the only hope that he had. Hey, he wasn't looking for hope in the Pope because there's none there. He was looking for the hope in the one true high priest. The one true prophet. The one true Messiah that had come. Because he had been seeking because he had heard. Now today you're hearing about King Jesus. You're seeing a little bit about Jesus. You're seeing his people get a little bit excited. Now it's up to you whether you want to surrender to who he is. Right. According to customs of the time, I, I, I wrote this in because I found it uh, interesting. Uh, this is from Alfred Eldersheim. He's a uh, Jewish convert to Christianity and a biblical doctor and a, a scholar. And he's got all kinds of cool stuff. But he knew about the customs of the time. And he was just, uh, just to give some context. There was such a great fear of the contagion in that time that if you had leprosy or even had the thought you had leprosy, you were forbidden to come within six feet of a healthy person. Now, I didn't make that six feet up. That's that's a scholarly thing. That's not me. But if the wind was blowing, it was 150 feet. Could you imagine, because you're responsible for keeping yourself away from people, could you imagine if you had a home outside the city and you were sleeping maybe outside in the dirt and the wind started blowing, you had to get up and leave. You had to get up and leave your home so that you weren't within 150 feet of a healthy person on a windy day. This is just context, folks. They were forbidden to be around healthy folks. They were restricted from the synagogue. They were not allowed to come anywhere near the synagogue. Some of the advocates had even, uh, some of the sources had even advocated throwing stones at them to keep them away from them. Now I told a cute story this morning. My mom would have advocated vacuum salesmen when they showed up at the door throwing rocks at them to try to keep them away. 
or insurance salesmen. I'm sure maybe if y'all grew up in that time era, they, everybody they come knock, they sell everything, they sell the house to you, and you owned it. And uh, but they would they would they would advocate throwing rocks to make sure they kept their distance. Now I tell you that to tell you this: this is just the stigma that surrounded these lepers. That's how bad nobody wanted them around. That's how bad nobody wanted them to even breathe the same air they were in. He was aware of his hope. He implored. That word implored means to beg. He begged Jesus. But I want you to see something. He didn't doubt. He didn't doubt who he was. He said, if you are willing. If you're, he knew that he could do it. He said, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He had confidence. And Jesus wasn't there to make sure he had a big bank account. Jesus could turn his life upside down and make him clean. Man. He wasn't just another prophet. He wasn't just another person. This was something special. His hope. The next thing I want you to see is he became aware of the answer. Jesus said, I am willing. Amen. I am willing. Now, if you're a blood-bought Christian in here and you've been saved by God's grace and you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt, let me tell you something. There was a time in your life that you got on your knees or got somewhere alone and you got in prayer and you said, Lord, if you're willing... <laughs> Lord, if you're willing to clean this old soul up. Lord, if you're willing, I know that you can save me. If you're willing to save me, you can drag me out of this mess. You can put me up on a high. You can put me on a foundation. Lord, if you're willing. Now listen, I'm going to tell you, some of y'all heard the answer. Some of y'all heard him say, I am willing. I am willing. Hey, if you haven't heard that answer, today can be the day you hear the answer where he says, I am willing. Miss Juanita got down here. I'm not trying to embarrass you, honey. Now she got down here Sunday. She said, I'm I'm sick of playing church. I'm sick of doing all these things. I wonder if he's willing. I said, he's willing. All you've got to do is pray. And she sat down here and she said, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. Not because I'm good enough. Not because I've given to the church. Not because I've been baptized. Not because I wore a suit today. But because I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And he said, I am willing. Amen. And he saved her soul. And, and you know what she did? She, she walked on the clouds all the way out of here. She still walked on the clouds. I can tell you by looking at her. Why? Because she's excited about what the only one that could have saved her has done for her. Because he's the only one. Listen, we spend so much time trying to dress sinners up to get them to come into church. We get so mad when sinners act like sinners. Hey, we need to get our heads on right and we need to start acting like Christians around them and then they'll get right. See, the problem is we're trying to act too much like them for them to think anything's different about us. Right. Amen, preacher. I'm trying. <laughs> did I preach that this morning? I think I did. <sighs> Y'all usually get extra that they did. <laughs> Aware of the answer. He said, I'm willing. He realized his condition. He was a sinner. And his solution was a savior. Now, here's the part I bet when I read you were thinking, what in the world? He said, I'm willing to be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses had commanded. See, he became aware of a change. Amen. He became aware of a change. He said, go show yourself to the priest. <laughs> I love this. Y'all got to get a hold of this. <laughs> He didn't send them out. Ooh, Lord, help him. Help him, Lord. Just preach him, preach him like a dying man to dying folk. He didn't send him out to the lost folk in the world. He sent him to the church. Yeah. He sent him to the synagogue and said, hey, you've been living this way, but your redemption is here and you're continuing to ignore it. You're continuing to pretend like he doesn't exist. He didn't send him to the lost folk. He sent him to church and said, hey, won't you go lead my people in the right direction they're supposed to go? They're full of religion. They're full of law. They full of the know-how, but they don't have the relationship with the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Now what they did during that time, it took about eight days. They would shave him, they'd give him clean clothes, they would bathe him, they'd make sure 
that he was clean. And then he would give testimony to the rabbis about who had healed him. <laughs> the testimony of change. He could get rituals of offerings. And he could go to church. But he had something they didn't. He had a relationship. <laughs> Why? Because he touched him. Amen. He made a change. <laughs> he made a change. And so he went about. He went about. And told him. And so if you can imagine. When God does something in your life. Listen, this is, this is how I want to help you. I want to, I want to help you here. See, as I said before, a lot of Christians, a lot of uh, people in the church, a lot of folks who, who are in churches all over America, they, they, they know about Jesus. They've heard all the stories. They could probably quote them better than I can. They, they've seen God work. They've seen uh, people healed of things. They've seen God move in other people's lives. And they've seen that God is real. And they've seen that he can do things. But they've never come to a point where they've truly surrendered it all. Amen. Give all over to him. I was going to lay down in here. But I, I thought it might be a bad idea for... Uh, people on the, the internet there to see the preacher laying on the floor. <laughs> but I want you to understand if you could just imagine what surrender looks like. That's not inviting God to come in and have a rental contract with you. That's saying, God, you own it. You take ownership back of it. I give it all over to you. And you tell me where to go and how to do it. The problem is we still have control over our lives. I told y'all something last week. I said the gospel is in this last dependent clause of this sentence. Y'all remember what it was? They forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. God, what would you have me do? How can I serve you today? What can I do? But most of us are more worried about how can I get my, my, my bank accounts built up? How can I do this? How can I fix this? How, and when I get older, I'm going to serve in that church. When I get things caught up, whenever I get my bills in line, whenever I get this, whenever I get my kids raised, whenever I do this, that, and the other, I've got the, hey, hey, you've got your list. Hey, I'm not picking on you. I used to have a list, and then I gave it to the Lord. But I had this whole list of things that I was going to do before I submitted to the call. I, I said, Lord, now, now, I'm okay with preaching as long as I don't have to stand in front of people. Now, I'm okay with bleeding <laughs> someone to Christ as long as I don't have to talk to somebody. I'm all right with proclaiming the gospel as long as you don't put me in front of a large crowd. Hey, listen, uh, John reminded me this morning, I was already nervous about it, but he reminded me this morning. He said, I heard you on the radio this morning. I said, man, that's good. Man, we've reached, I don't know, I think they said ten to 15,000 people today with the gospel. Praise God, amen. amen. Because I tell you what, there's a lot of preachers out there that'll preach, and they've got the backbone of a, of a, of a, of a little uh, a string. They don't have the backbone to stand up and say, hey, just because you're in church don't mean you're saved. Just because you're doing things in the church don't mean you're saved. If that's what saves you, then I can go stand in a garage and it'll make me a car. Yes. <laughs> It's about getting in there and serving God. I want to give you a little example. I heard a... Oh, I'm not done preaching. <laughs> I heard a man tell me this week. Now listen. Your preacher can be as fired up as he wants to. Man, I can be at every social event. I can be there with a shirt and tie on and look as pretty as can be, shine my shoes, shine my teeth. Or, well, I guess you shine your teeth, I don't know. <laughs> I can be at every event. I can be a part of every club in Randolph County. They said, man, that, that's a good guy. Boy, he's got some charisma. I tell you, I like him. <laughs> but there ain't nothing that get a hold of folks when the people in the church start saying, man, I got to tell you what God's doing down there. <laughs> I got to tell you what God's doing down there. Man, God's moving. God is moving, man. I, I want to tell you something. That church has seen four souls saved in eight weeks. Man. Four souls saved in eight weeks. And you want me to tell you how long these men have put off themselves and been praying for it? 
eight weeks. <laughs> kind of funny how that coincides, isn't it? See, I tell them, I change the verse. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, I said, if my men, if my men, the one who God has laid the responsibility on and given the responsibility to stand in the gap for those who don't, when they get serious about God, Amen. God will start doing Amen. some things. And can I say, praise God for the four that we've seen. Can I say, praise God to Him because He's continuing to work. He's continuing to do. It's not about me. It's not about my name. It's about His name. Until we get over that and stop thinking, man, if we just tell people about the preacher, hey, forget about the preacher, man. Tell them about the real man. The, 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 the man that, that can save them. I can't save them, but I can tell you a man that can. I can't do anything for their lives, but I know a man that can. I can't change their bad habits, but I know a man that can. Because how do you know, preacher? Because I want to testify just a little bit this morning. Are you ready? There was a boy one time. He thought he had his life all in order. He thought he had everything together. I thought I could live both sides of the fence. I could drink a little, dope, dope a little, run around with this one. I could live however I want to. And just whenever I started feeling bad, I could say, Lord, forgive me. I, I, I've been a bad person. And then go right back out there and get involved back in it again. Let me tell you something. I, there was one day coming by that I was ended up, I found myself in a jail cell. And I seen that God come by and I said, God, why did you let this happen to me? He said, I didn't let you happen to you, but I haven't left you while you've been there. I didn't let it happen to you. You let it happen to you. But I never left you. I never forsook you. I never let you go. I may have felt alone, but he never left me. Amen. And I said whenever I did, <laughs> couldn't find anybody to bail me out. <laughs> I begged everybody. I said, bail me out. I promise I'll change this time. <laughs> Nobody would bail me out. So when I got home, I finally bailed myself out. I didn't bail bond. I made old money. I don't know. But I got home and I said, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to give this. I'm tired of living this life. I'm tired of trying to do things my way. I'm tired of trying to make things work out the way I want them to work out. I'm tired of trying to live my life the way I've lived. And so you know what I had to do? You know what I had to do? I had to surrender it up to Him. It wasn't that I was halfway there. I had to give it all up to Him. I had to fully surrender and lay prostrate on the ground and give up all my defenses and give up all my abilities and say, Lord, if you can take this thing and use something of it, then praise God. I want to tell you something. I'm not much as far as being a good man. I'm not much as much as I would want to be, but I'm certainly, by the grace of God, not the man that I used to be. I'll never be the man that I used to be. And by God's grace, I'll continue preaching until they kick me into the hole. Amen. Y'all <sighs> wear me out. <laughs> Mercy, y'all wear me out. I'm going to cut back on my coffee. <laughs> The leper's approach to Jesus graphically is illustrated. The penitent sinner. Listen. He cast aside his self-righteousness. Any hope he could have had. Any hope. Many of y'all were waiting, waiting for that perfect moment. I'm going to tell you something. It's never going to come. Right. Preacher, sure what are you saying? It's never going to come. The devil's always going to give you an excuse. Lord, if you go down that altar, what will people think about you? Amen. You can't go down that altar. Why, you've been a deacon for 55 years. I hope none of y'all been a deacon for 55 years. <laughs> Why, you've been a preacher. You've been a teacher. You've done this. You've done that. I'll share one more story with you. I had a story shared with me of a gentleman. He uh, taught, went to went to church. I think taught Sunday school. Very involved. I mean, I mean, he, he's there. Had his family in church. Got sat down. Got to read his Bible. <laughs> Can I tell you how, how thankful I am for this Word of God? I tell you, this is the absolute word of God. There is nothing to add to or take away. This is God's word. 
All these, all these liberals out here are waiting for a, a, another word from God. Hey, man, until you get this digested, you don't need another word from God. You need to get this thing hammered down. But anyway, he sat down, he's reading the word of God, and he's reading, and he's looking, and he's realizing that he's been a, he's been a teacher, he's been a, 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 a big part of the church, and he is lost as the day is long. But he didn't stay that way. He didn't stay that way. He didn't stay that way. He got up and he got that relationship started. He asked Jesus Christ to come into his heart and to change him, wreck his life and turn it upside down. And then he went and told his wife and told his kids, hey, hey, if you're playing the game and you're pretending, I want you to know that there's a Savior that can save you. I want you to know that the game is not worth it in the end because I'll tell you what, the devil's going to do everything he can do to get you to play that game, stay in that game until we're up here burying you. Right. And then it's eternally too late. But it's not too late right now to make that decision. Say, I, I give up. I surrender. Because I want you to know something. That leper, oh, the things that could have happened to that leper. <laughs> oh, the things that could have happened to that leper if the church crowd had been around. They'd have stoned him. Yeah, they would have. But my Savior, he didn't just yell out from a distance, Brendan, and say, oh, I heal you, stay over there. He reached out and touched him. Amen. That's the Savior I serve. He'll reach out and touch you. Amen. And get a hold of you. And I'm going to warn you, he's going to wreck your world. <laughs> he's going to turn your world upside down. He's going to shake you up and get you so fired up. You may not even realize you got so fired up about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear Father, Father God, I thank you so much, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the testimony that I have, Lord. Lord, I pray, Father, I pray that even today, Father, I know that there's a <coughs> lot of folks who are eat up with sin and they are eat up with themselves and pride and everything else, Father, and and we like to put a pretty bow on it and pretend like it doesn't exist. But, Father, you see the very hearts of men. You see the very insides of men. And, Father, you're calling for surrender. You're calling for us to surrender. And, Father, I pray that each one gathered here, Lord, at some point in time in their life that they have surrendered. Father, if not, God... I pray that you break their hearts today, Father. I pray that you bring them to a place where they know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if they were to die, that they would be in your arms, Father. There is nothing in this world worth going to hell for, God. Lord, I pray that you break any, any bonds or anything that could be holding anybody back today, Father. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name that we cast those out, Father. God, I pray that you just draw them unto you, Father. Lord, you said that no man cometh unto you unless the Father draws them, Father. And so, Father, I pray that you begin to draw them, Father, and bring them to a relationship with you, Father. Lord, being in a church and being on a membership or being baptized isn't good. Is it going to cut it, Father? It's that relationship with the Holy God. And First John says that you can know that you know that you know, Father. And I know that you're a, a, a loving God and that you're just waiting to hear us say, if you're willing and you're waiting to respond, <laughs> I am willing. And so, Father, I pray that you touch each heart, each life that's gathered here today, Father. And I ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Can I ask you to stand with me, please?